little bit about your personal origin story. How did you become so interested in 19th century France and French women? Um, so that's a good question. And I never quite have the perfect answer. I studied, started studying French in high school um, just as a kind of personal passion. And it wasn't enough to just be president of French club, I guess. I just had to go on and get a PhD <laughs> in French. Um, and I studied a lot of feminism in college, but when I was getting my PhD, I was mostly studying um, male writers as far as it, it goes for um, the 19th century, which was the period that I was most interested in, you know, the Balzac and the Flaubert and the Zola and all that good stuff. Um, but I was really struggling with my dissertation topic. And when I went to meet with my advisor, he said to me, you know, what about, what about women writers from this time period? And I was just like, there aren't women writers, you know, I mean, yes, there's, you know, George Sand, okay. And Rashield I had heard of a little more obscure, but known to French scholars. And he just listed off um, a dozen writers who I'd never heard of. And, and that was that. I just wanted to know why I'd never heard of them. Um, and that's what I ended up doing my dissertation on. And of course, um, it, well, it led to all three of these books and there's just still so much fascinating work to be done. Well, let's look at the first one, your first book, The Hysterics Revenge. Um, tell us a little bit about, about what the message of this book was. Um, sure, so this was kind of the, the product that of, of that initial query. That's a picture of Colette, by the way, um, that amazing cover. Um, and um, I was, you know, having studied these 19th century male writers, they seemed to me really interested in female sexuality um, during this time. And there was a lot of writing about hysteria. Hysteria becomes the kind of illness of the century that everyone is hearing about. And there's this explosion of diagnoses in the late 19th century, um, along with the um, development of all kinds of new sciences and all kinds of medical writings about the female body that um, make their way into books like Flaubert's Madame Bovary, um, so many of no Zola's works, all of these, these writers were reading medical writings. Okay. We um, have a picture and, to sort yeah. of illustrate that. Yes, exactly. So, um, so this picture is just kind of the, um, the shorthand for that entire project <laughs> um, because it's, um, you know, Charcot giving the legendary hysteric, hysteria doctor um, giving a lesson at the Salpetriere Hospital. Um, and as you can see, there are all these male students um, in the audience. Um, and then there's the woman who is the hysteric on display. Um, and um, my question really was, what about her? How does one write from that position? right? Women were writing in this time period. So what were they writing about if sort of the dominant discourses were kind of obsessed with this, this composition, this, this vantage point? How does one write and think when so much of the culture and the writing in the culture is about you being an hysteric or being this kind of sexualized entity? What did women's voices sound like there? And that was the idea of the hysterics revenge, um, which was, you know, kind of the greatest fear from these male writers is, what, what I was arguing in that book was that even though there was so much writing about women's bodies being dangerous and the femme fatale, you know, um, and sort of the dangerousness of that kind of figure, what these male writers seemed actually, when you get down to it, most worried about was women who could think and women who could write. So the hysteric famously becomes an hysteric, the, fem the female hysteric often starts out reading novels. And what happens when you read too many novels? God forbid, you start to write them. And that was really what was at the heart of it, I found in these writings, in the medical writings, actually. It's the medical writings that are talking about novel reading. And then you start realizing, oh, they're worried about female intellect. And the whole conversation about women's bodies and you know, disease and prostitution, um, and sexuality was really kind of a way of distracting from the real anxiety, which is that, that would really transform social structures, which is if women started writing 
So they had a kind of domino theory that first you read a book <laughs> and then you, you, the family starts to unravel because oh, yeah. you, you, you take on a male role. And before you know it, there's sort of a generalized social collapse. Exactly. Um, also, your uterus would dry up from that reading and writing. So well, that really does happen, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed. Exactly. Um, so, uh, and, and you focused on writers, but I assume that it's just a small percentage of women who, who wrote books. Um, well, there were lots of women writing throughout the 19th century. Um, and so what actually what happens at the end of the 19th century, there are new, there are educational reforms that allow and require secondary schooling for young women. And the consequence of that, it was not intended for that reason. It was intended to kind of wrest power away from the church because women being, girls being educated in convents um, meant that they had a certain affiliation with the church. And so it was, that was kind of the motivation there was to kind of um, take some power away from there by educating women elsewhere. The consequence of course, was that women were educated and then they wanted to be part of society in all kinds of ways. And actually, right, they did read novels and then they did want to write them um, and go to law school and med school and all those other things. So there is an explosion of women writers um, starting in the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s. And there are all kinds of male writers responding to that more explicitly than the earlier was, uh, uh, where they're sort of just worried about this happening in the future and the hysterics. Later on, it becomes this real thing. Um, but yeah, they're all there. You know, there's there's endless of these novels. Women, it was a real. People were genuinely concerned that there would be more women writers than male writers. That they were taking away their livelihoods. It's the explosion of the mass press as well. So women can write for newspapers, and they do. Um, and so women's voices are everywhere. There's all kinds of ways in which women can participate um, in this way. And it causes a lot of anxiety and you have these kind of treatises about the problem of women's writing, um, which then go into that, right? It's gonna dry up the uterus, right? It's bad, it's bad for the future. We won't produce enough healthy French boys. They won't marry. Um, and also they will write more than us and then what will happen, you know, that sort of between the lines. Um, so I was really fascinated by that and also by the fact that I hadn't heard of any of these women writers. Um, but the other piece, and this is really kind of part of what's kind of kept me going for, for the years since that first book, is that you can find these books, right? Um, because it's so recent, the actual physical copies from the 1890s, they're in American libraries, original copies that no one's read in 100 years. They're at the bouquinis that line the streets of, uh, of Paris, you know, on, along the Seine. You so if you were going to recommend a, a one book to get sort of to dive into this world, what would be the first one that you would tell people to read? Okay, that's a good question. Most of them are not, you know, in contemporary editions um, at this point, but I guess Marcel Tiner, who's someone I'll, I'll talk about in, in relationship to the, the second book, um, you, if you are in Paris and you're looking at these, or if you go on eBay, I'll tell you all my vices, eBay or what's now like Rakuten, I think, all of these kind of booksellers online, they sell old books and old magazines. And you can find Marcel Tiner, all kinds of, La Maison du Péché is, is uh, maybe this, the one to start with, or La Rebelle, right, the, the rebel. Um, you, can, you can find those online for, you know, 10 euros probably. Let's Thank let's go on to your to your next book in the series because you um, they're they're a trilogy at this point mm -hmm. um, where you you wrote having it all in the Belle Epoque based on these two women's magazines you discovered that came into being at the start of the twentieth century. Did you just hap are these did you happen onto these uh, magazines at a Bucaniste? Is that how you found them? Um, sort of. So. My, dessert, my the, the Hysterics Revenge was really kind of literary readings and I'm trained in a literature PhD. And so that's kind of what I knew how to do. I was doing these kind of close analyses of how these women were representing themselves. And when I was finishing or kind of had finished that book, um, I was following up on some details that I was intrigued by actually, because I had written about Marcel Tiner's novel, The House of Sin, La Maison du Péché um, in that book. And um, I had read some scandal about her 
being possibly named the Legion of Honor, and I wasn't sure. And so following out, following the details of that, I was sort of interested in the celebrity culture. I went to the, to the Bibliothèque Nationale, and I had to go and like look this up on microfilm. And it took me to microfilm, mic microfiche actually of these magazines, which doesn't do it justice, right? To see them, to sort of scroll through them on a screen. But there I found that the people whose novels I had hunted down in libraries were actually these women quasi celebrities or not even quasi, they were celebrities in these women's magazines. And I was totally floored because I had just been a good literature student just reading my novels. It turns out there are photo spreads of Marcel Tiner. Which they were the sort of a liter literary elite of their day, the sort of Parisian exactly. elite. They would go to parties with each other and they all knew each other. They knew each other, they were in overlapping circles. Um, and I just didn't really quite know what to do with magazines because I hadn't ever written about them as such, but I was in love with them. And then later on, I would, I actually like found physical copies. Here is just for scale. I have a whole collection behind me, but. That you can um, still buy at Bucaniste along the banks of the Seine today. You can buy them online at the Bucaniste, at the, um, you know, any of like some of these old booksellers, the shops have them. Um, and they're absolutely gorgeous. So, um, so, so these magazines were fighting against a kind of stereotype that existed then about women. And I, we wanted to show a slide of some of these stereotypes. Yeah, um, right. And so the first book had, had was sort of firmly in these stereotypes. This is from Daumier's series on the blue stocking. The women, write, women writers were known as blue stockings. That was sort of the derogatory term for them. Um, in the 19th century. And Domi had this whole series devoted to them showing, um, you know. Domi is a cartoonist, of, of, a well-known cartoonist of the day. Yes, thank you, yes. Um, very well known. And so these were published in newspapers, right? This whole series making fun of the Bableau, the blue stocking, the woman writer who was, as you can see, um, I like to refer to these as my self-portraits. <laughs> but uh, right, the baby in the bathwater um, was was doing was not being the ideal wife and mother that we aspire to. Right, she's abandoning her children, um, blowing smoke in her husband's face, or you know whoever this guy is, um, not refusing to sew buttons. And this was what right. This is what happens when your uter uterus dries up. Um, these are all kind of of a piece. Abandoning. You can see why this is a threat and depicted as a threat to French values throughout the 19th century. Um, but what I found in these two magazines, which were the first magazines, women's magazines to use photography. Um, so really the reason it's those two is though they were the first. Photography is invented in France in the 19th century. And slowly the technology is such that it can be reprinted in publications, but not so much in daily publications, but in these like monthly or bi-monthly magazines. And what I found was that um, the that these magazines. So I, I I was tracing. I was interested in how women writers appeared here, and that's what I initially kind of just followed through the first ten years of these magazines. Um, and I realized that they are they were working very hard to show that the woman writer was not a threat to French family and values, and that hence the name, right? The women French woman writer could have it all. Um, and they were just very carefully constructed, literally against Daumier's image. And I don't know if this photograph actually was done with that image, that um, Daumier character in mind, um, but it's so striking how kind of point for point it reproduces the image to show like, no, she has her manuscript on one hand, that's under her elbow, holding the daughter in another, the house is in, is, you know, is beautiful with lovely furniture and the wallpaper and the daughter's holding a doll. So, you know, she's getting the right values too and she's gonna be a mother too. And it's, it's all gonna be just fine because, you know, we can balance femininity and feminism. So and a, a number of people in chat are making reference to what was happening um, in the US at the same time, how women were characterized in the suffrage movement and they're seeing a lot of parallels. Was there, do you see those parallels too? Um, there's certainly parallels, and of course, the mass press is taking off, and magazines are 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 being launched in the 19th century um, in uh, in the U.S. as well. What is kind of specific to it 
um, has to do with this very specific valence of the blue stocking um, and the very and the specific valence of, of French feminism as opposed to American feminism, which is really highlighting the femininity of these women. And as part of why these magazines sort of is not, have really weren't considered feminists, like no one looked at them, they just kind of assumed they were fashion magazines because they're really um, trying very hard to make these women look beautiful and not threatening. Um, and it's that is very particular to this cultural circumstance because what makes it feminist is that it was working against this misogynist um, you know, uh, iconography that had been around throughout the 19th century. It's really like their picture after picture of these writers with their pearls looking, you know, ultra, ultra feminine um, in a way that is, and even in the articles sometimes it would literally say like, see, they're not blue stockings. Look at how they're balancing everything. Aren't they so lovely? And you can really see that they're speaking to something very specific in France. I just wanted to get to your next slide because it's very, <laughs> It's very funny, <laughs> which is updating the same image, obviously. Yeah, I mean, um, part of what was so fun for me writing this book was I just couldn't believe that I was finding these things in these magazines that were launched in 1901. And that the messaging, you know, it was a total plus a change situation. Um, it was, and it was right when in the US, this, the whole having it all conversation was relaunched with Emory Slaughter's article in the Atlantic that asked, can women really have it all? That was like, I think in 2011-ish, I think was when that article came out. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, we were revisiting these same questions and um, that is that is it from an Amex ad with Tina Fey um, that, you know, kind of shows where we, where we were, where we are now, which is the recognition that, you know, I mean that a second after that photo of Chinair was taken, <laughs> all hell might've broken loose, right? This is a construction and a fantasy. Um, and we've sort of acknowledged that now. The, the, the French talked about the modern women, la femme moderne, but in America or in the, at least in the Anglophone word, world, we were talking about the new woman. And those, the modern woman with the French one, the new one was the young, and those, they were very different characters. So the new woman existed, you know, la femme nouvelle in, in France was a, uh, a term as well. And what was interesting, it was a kind of Anglo import, the same terminology, um, but it had, again, a different valence, different associations in France. So what was frustrating and interesting to me as a historian and a literary scholar um, was that people sort of took on the French use of this term in the 1890s in their scholarship in the 21st century. And when I went back and look at these women writers, they were saying, don't call me that because it had such negative associations. And so the women who were writing at the time, when you listen to what they were saying about themselves, it was super complicated and they didn't see themselves as feminists because that word was didn't really mean what we, you know, what it means now. And they did not want to be called new women because that was something that was associated with the feminist which was also very negatively coded in France. Um, and this so- is really, This is really important because the coding in France is that if you're a feminist, then you're, um, you lose your femininity, you become masculine and you in a way supplant men and the family ceases to work as we were talking about before. Yes, um, that was the fear. And that's what they're really working against. Um, the novels in some ways allow them to explore this in a kind of more nuanced way where they like explore the conflict between work and family, whereas, whereas the magazines are like, it's great, we have it all figured out, we can do it. Um, because like, it's just really, they stay on message in a different way. But the women's voices themselves tell a really complicated self-aware story of the, the struggle um, of trying to figure out in this transitional moment um, at the turn of the 19th century, really like uh, the magazines run up till World War I and then they really turn into something else. Um, but, um, but in that moment, it's a really, it's an interesting moment in feminist history because it's not really recorded. And it's not recorded because laws are not passed. Laws are debated, but they don't really pass. Women do not get suffrage in France until way, way later um, or in America for, uh, for that matter. And so, um, and so we kind of lost this history. And what I'm interested in are the questions that were asked, the stories that were being told that aren't recorded in kind of legal changes, but were experienced in the moment and um, really help us to understand this time period and to see that these are not 
the questions we're facing now are not new questions, right? And they were asked in this particular context in this really interesting and relatable way. Let, let's look at some more of the magazine covers. Um, so there were two magazines. Um, there was Femina and La Vie Heureuse. Femina came first, right? Yeah, so Femina comes first. And basically the guy, Pierre Lafitte, who, in, who launches it is just an entrepreneur. He's not a feminist, but he understands demographics. And he seems to understand very quickly that if you give women a positive image of themselves, they're gonna buy your magazine. Um, so it's not like the guy had this master plan. It's something he brings together. He understands innovation. He understands photography. And he puts these things together and the women respond. And so it transforms very quickly um, and is immediately wildly successful. So successful that it gets this rival, La Vireuse, which is very similar. And in the end, they fuse together um, in, uh, I think it's 1917, La, La Vireuse becomes part of Femina. And the prize, the Prix Femina, is originated actually in La Vireuse, and then it's the Prix Femina. Which is one of the major French annual literary prizes. Yes, to this day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and its innovation is that it's decided by a jury of women. So it can go to a man or a woman, but it's the women who decide, which I think is just so interesting. Does it, it, has it had any of the problems that French literary juries are having now? I mean, <laughs> uh, that's a good question, actually. I haven't followed it so specifically, but it has its own, it has its own history, you know, um, as one might imagine. Um, so just in terms of the semiotics of these magazine covers, and I think they were also aspirational too, you write, that it wasn't that people thought they could all, with the women, there were many very middle-class readers. These are obviously quite elite. Uh, upper class women, but the like the tennis picture I love partially because I just love tennis. That yeah. she's extremely she's in this extremely elegant dress, and yet she's she's doing a, a, a she's athletic. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of amazing tennis pictures and sports pictures. Um, I, um, I, I I I that's the bowler also that I was just showing you, and I think we have another picture of it maybe, but the tennis I love because the skirt is flowing, right? And it's these active women that are still just, they're just so fabulous. It makes me think about the Nike ads um, of our day as well, right? Like just do it. Um, but there, the messaging here um, is just, I, it's just fantastic, right? So- What is this woman on a, on a, on a ladder? <laughs> Yes. Okay. So this is a picture. It's funny how their copyright laws were different. Also, that's a photo that you find in German magazines, not entirely clear where it was or who took it, but the caption is feminism on a high scale, like ha ha ha. Right. Um, they're also doing things with Photoshop, not, uh, you know, avant la lettre, right. But not actual Photoshop, but they're dot, they love that they can sort of doctor photos and do all kinds of fun things with it as in both of these images. But what I love about these two um, is that it, it's the message, right? It's like women can, I'm, I'm showing you that women can climb mountains. Um, they can climb literal mountains. And of course the magazine is telling you in all kinds of ways that women can achieve in new ways. Um, feminism on a high scale, right? Is this literalization of feminism. And of course, that's not the feminism that you're associating with the blue stocking and these kind of negative images, right? It's just, it's fun. It's fabulous. She's wearing a dress. <laughs> it's hard to understand how she's up there. Um, and this woman in pants that's climbing mountains, she's got her cute little hat, right? It's not threatening. It's, it's fun. It's alluring. Um, and that's the message of these magazines. The message is also that these women are having a kind of personal journey, that they have the right to the, to, a narr to their own narrative. Yeah, you know, still with their families intact, because there's often with the women writers, you have the picture of the women, <clears throat> and then you show them dusting, like they're at their desk, and then they're dusting, or they're kissing their babies. Um, and yeah, there's the bowler who love also. Um, they don't have color photography, but they do kind of these color covers that they can do. Um, but but um, but at the and and what it what the magazines do is they they invite women to participate. So it's what I call the democratization of intellect, um, meaning that um, there's poetry contests, right? They're saying, women, you have a novel in you. Just pick up the pen. What do you need Flaubert to tell the story of how French women love? You can tell how French women love. And then they have these contests that they compete in um, that are kind of alongside the Prix Femina, the, the, the 
the Femina Prize and other um, book prizes. So it really invites the readers to feel a part of it. And of course, that's great for sales too, because you want to buy the magazine to see if you if your poem made it to the contest. And, uh, and La Vie Heureuse, as again, you see like just the variety <laughs> of different kinds of um, fabulous women, uh, you know, on the cover. Um, the fisher woman and the swimmer with the rifle. Um, I had um, on one of my blog posts, an image from one ish, I had sort of taken images from one single issue of the magazine. And there was one that had this woman doing splits and acrobatics as, and I saw, saw that also as part of the semiotics. It's like, you know, look at all the different shapes that women can put themselves in and they still emerge, you know, smiling and lovely. And we, we now think of women's magazines as being written entirely by women, but it, in, in this case, at least at the beginning, they, a lot of them were written by men. Yeah, in fact, you know, the, uh, the Pierre Lafitte, he brought together, first, actually what happened was he had these women that were involved in La Mode Pratique, which was one of the main fashion magazines. And, um, and then he was like, you guys are too boring. You're not thinking outside the box. And so he brought in some of his photographers and people who were doing more innovative work in his, he had a kind of mainstream other uh, sports magazine um, that also had already launched with photography in 1898. And after about three months of Femina where it was, there wasn't enough images and it wasn't exciting, he fired some of the women that he had brought over from La Mode Pratique and started over with these innovative journalists bringing along people who were famous women writers to be part of it as well. Um, and so, I mean, you have all kinds of weird things that we wouldn't, we'd be a little uncomfortable characterizing as feminists out of context. For example, male writers writing in women's voices um, and sort of speaking on behalf of women in a way that feels perhaps paternalistic. Um, so it's a conservative feminism. It's a very, you know, it's, 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 um, it's not without, uh, you know, there, it, it doesn't, it only takes you so far, um, but it was doing something really, really interesting in response to the moment. We also have some fans with the hat in the second photo coming over chat. <laughs> I mean, listen, you can see why I had a little collection and I never wanted this book project to end. Um, you, I, you know, there's just endless, endless delights to be found in there. And that was, for me, having read in microfilm and really studied these academically, when I actually held this one in my, this wasn't the first one that I had, but, and I have a bunch of them framed around my house, um, but just holding the material object in my hand was just, I mean, I talk about it in my introduction of just the love at first sight of, um, of that project. And, uh, you know, I, I'm always so happy to talk about it and always happy to re return to these magazines because they're cultural artifacts and they contain so much. There's so much to interpret from the advertising to the stories, to the contests, to the photo spreads. They are just such a microcosm of this moment. Yeah, and because these magazines were so pervasive, Rachel, as you described, you would find them on doctor's offices and sort of in everybody's, uh, in everybody's homes uh, around the country and not just among the elites. Um, wh what kind of pushback was there? against these magazines and against this idea of the modern woman that was that, that the magazines were selling. There so were, there were fascist newspapers it, that were starting up around the same time. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting about it is that people, this was mostly a conversation between women. There was a powerful conversation between women that led to um, sort of the, the, the rise of the woman writer. Women were convinced and many people who were associated with the magazine <laughs> were convinced that women would be elected to the Académie Française, women writers would be elected to the French Academy imminently um, at the time. By 1909, 1910, they were certain, even though um, that didn't happen until 1980. But in 1909, 1908, 1909, they were convinced of it. What um, are we Can you tell us what we're seeing yeah. here on the screen? Yeah, so this is that uh, early, this is what a, you know, Photoshop feminism, as I like to call it. Um, this is, they had a, a, a survey um, of which women writers, living or dead, would you want elected to the French Academy? And this is une académie féminine, because one of the debates was, should we just have our own academy? And that was sort of the prize, we'll have our own jury, which was in response to a woman writer, Miriam Harry, 
not winning an award um, for the Prix Goncourt that they, people thought that she should have won. So they created their own jury. And so one, one line of thinking was, well, we'll just create our own academy. And this was that fantasy. Let's create our own academy. Let's fantasize about it. Who would we elect? Um, and you have people, um, you know, we, you have like Madame de Sévigné in there somewhere along with Marcel Tiner and people who were contemporaries that they, so I just love that that was part of the work of Femina was imagining that, right? The imaginative work of saying, you can, it's what we do all the time in the modern media. Um, we advance all kinds of causes by imagining a female vice president, female president, a gay, a gay family or a pres or a politician, right? We do it in television before it happens in reality. And so I think Femina understood that and they were doing that. Um, through these magazines, and they really were pushing things forward. Unfortunately, World War I came and the progress, I think, was largely halted um, because of that. But, um, but there was a world in which everyone was convinced that women would be elected, a world that was circumscribed in the mainstream, which to answer your question, the main quote unquote mainstream press some people were totally unaware that the woman writer was rising in this way um, and super nervous about it. And so that's where you get this pushback, anxiety about women writers kind of taking over. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't just in the literary sphere. You talk about how the, these magazines started talking about marriage reform and divorce laws and eventually women's suffrage too. Um, they do, but in a very careful way. Um, and yes, there are all kinds of, there are all kinds of writings and, um, and the questions around divorce laws are there plays about that? So that's happening um, in the literary sphere. And yes, there are all kinds of debates um, that, that carry over, but mostly in Femina, even though they're debating changes to marriage law, they're debating specifically whether that um, the, the formulation from the Napoleonic Code that women owe men obedience in um, exchange for protection. There was a big debate on the 100th anniversary in 1904 of whether that should be changed to something about love or equality. And by and large, um, the magazine said, oh, we don't, we don't want to change the law, you know. But here, here's some women who, who have these equal marriages. I mean, the law is not really something we should concern ourselves with. Mostly was how they sort of responded to that. Why and did they also, take that position, do you think? I think that there is um, there was a kind of deep-seated um, anxiety about associating with politics. I think it comes from an idea, from a from kind of idea about sexual difference, about the difference between men and women um, and about French femininity that has its roots probably in the enlightenment that preserves that difference as a value. And one of the ways in which that's articulated is that well, women, we don't need politics. That's not what we're asking for. We can advance in our own sphere. Um, and so politics, and things like suffrage in France, people really, many women who, who seem like they're feminists um, aren't sort of advocating for, for suffrage or aren't, don't, don't wanna use the word feminist because they don't wanna be associated with politics and they see that as, separately, as separate and threatening to their femininity. So they will come out and say these things and write novels that seem like really um, subversive and seem to be challenging all those things but they will not want to sort of take it up in the legal sphere or relate it to politics. And that's part of why their writings are so important because they didn't take it up in the legal sphere because those laws didn't pass. We miss the fact that there were, you know, there, there was a, a mindset that was ready for it in another way. Um, one thing that's amazing in reading your books is are the echoes with contemporary French women and, and, and the ongoing ambivalence that um, at least a, I would say an older generation of women have here, like older, including my age and older, um, have a, about being called feminists. And, and there seems to be the same tension between um, femininity and, and feminism. And uh, it, it's remarkable how consistently it's been preserved, that conversation has been preserved. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was part of what so fascinated me. It's just these things that are really embedded in the culture. Um, and if they're, if they're sort of not out in the open or they're not being debated um, or rejected, they just, you know, they, they, they stay there. And that's, that's absolutely, that, 
that working out of the relationship between femininity and feminism, that was the idea of this femme moderne, the, the, a word that it has, is meant to not be political, right? Um, and so the, the, the kind of opening first issues of these magazines say very explicitly, we're not gonna, don't worry, we're not talking about emancipation here. Uh, we're talking about freedom, but not emancipation, you know? It's this sort of sidestepping of it. And we'll just offer this picture of the modern woman. What, what's the difference between freedom and emancipation in this case? Is that vo about voting? I mean, I'm, I'm being facetious. It wasn't, um, but they, emancipation rights is a political word. Yes, about voting. That was like a PhD level humor that I do not understand. <laughs> <laughs> I just mean that they were really, um, that in terms of the words that they would use, it's, a, it's really amazing this kind of statement of purpose um, that's in the first issue of Finina that kind of tries to say, readers, don't be frightened. It's a women's magazine, but we're not gonna do anything scary here. Um, and it's really interesting how some of those questions make their way in. And there are, I love there's these surveys that are, you know, should women vote? And the answer, the headline is, should women vote? No, <laughs> um, but it's very split. It's very split. It's like 49 to 51% in terms of the answers that they get. Um, and, uh, and so they, they just, they, they very much wanted to make this, these publications um, about something else to sort of not get into the weeds of, of those arguments um, and really just offer something through which the medium was the message, right? These images were the message. And so um, you didn't have to, you know, even though it was very much about the same issues, you didn't have to acknowledge that to enjoy them and, and see yourself differently as a result. Rachel, could I ask a question? How does this all develop or indeed end for a while? You mentioned the First World War is a watershed. Um, you know, the French far right becomes more and more active. And eventually with Vichy, they push the woman back into the house. So is this a kind of period of flowering of a sort of feminism that later goes back? Absolutely, it is. And I think it's overlooked again, because it doesn't, we can't say like, oh, in 1907, you know, this major thing happened. Um, but it was very much a, a flowering of feminism. Um, a, and the, the women writers are succeeding. And what's remarkable is when you go back, when you go to those later periods, they don't, are they're not aware of this history. You know, so it's also about who gets to who gets to tell the stories, you know, history, as we know, recorded by the victors. This is one of those examples where um, the historical import to literary history, to feminist history has been sort of overlooked because it was recorded in these women's magazines. Um, and so you have people kind of reinventing the wheel and sort of similar things sort of you know, happening in the, in the 50s and 60s, and then again in the 80s and 90s, without an, a, a clear understanding that this thing has has roots and it's happened before. You know, even if people knowing where the Femina Prize comes from is something, you know, people- Are there French scholars who are looking at the same material that you are? Um, not, uh, I mean, so gender in France and the French Academy is very, very new. Um, and it's, it's, it's not nearly as sort of developed of a discipline as it is in the US. Um, and interdisciplinary stories, which uh, studies, which is what I'm doing, right? Because it's literary, it's literary history, but it's cultural history, it's magazine history, it's art history, looking at the visual piece. These are not really um, fostered by the French Academy where people tend to stay, have to stay in their own lane. Um, and so doing this kind of what we would call cultural studies, reading of a magazine, like looking at it as a text um, is not something that you find in, in French scholarship. So people were kind of taking these as face value. That's what I thought was so interesting. Historians would sometimes refer to these magazines and be like, according to Femina, blah, 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 blah. And there's no according to, Femina is a fantasy. It's like, it's like, according to People Magazine, you know, that's not really facts. Like that's a construction. That's someone in 1907 or four or whatever it is telling, you know, constructing an idea of what women could be as opposed to historians who at first looked at this and said, whoa, it looks like women were pretty equal according to these magazines. Um, and that's what, you know, I wanted to sort of 
Catholic. Are you in conversation with French scholars about this or is it mostly like you're in the Anglosphere? No, I, I, I mean, I was, I did a conference um, the last time I was in Paris, which was over a year ago now at the Sorbonne, which was on women and magazines. Um, but it tends, it, it's not, it's, it's not quite its own. There's some young people who are working on this. And yes, I, I, um, I, I have, I have published parts of this in French and um, in various, you know, kinds of contexts of women, French women writers and, and, and things like that. Um, and, and, and especially, you know, younger scholars who are starting to, to look at these things are, are super curious and interested. Yeah, I, I was going to um, say that among younger feminists and younger women in France, there is a real desire to sort of break out of the, the, the dichotomy of you know, feminine, femininity versus feminism and, and to sort of break, break and to move to something that's more uh, uh, Anglophone, more recognizable to, to us as Americans. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, I mean, it's warranted. These are helpful frameworks. Um, and some of them we got from France. I mean, I learned how to do semiotics from a French thinker, Roland Barthes, um, who I learned about, of course, in an American university. Actually at this conference at the Sorbonne, it's kind of a funny story. Um, well, I mean, so it, that there was a, a, an older male professor who kind of spoke at the end to kind of offer his blessing to everything we were doing on women. Um, so there was this funny kind of structural thing built in and he launched into a whole diatribe about American feminism, assuming that everyone in the, everyone who was there was French. And not, I was, you know, absolutely going crazy listening to this, but it was this whole fantasy about what we learned to do in, in America. And that's not how we do things here. I mean, this was like a year and a half ago. Um, but the other sort of, to your point, classic um, kind of question that came up when I was working in the French libraries at the Marguerite Durand Library in Paris, which is a absolutely wonderful gem. Um, it's the feminist library in Paris and it has all kinds of um, wonderful collections there. And it's a tiny little library. But the first time I worked there and I was kind of looking around and looking in their card catalog at the time and the woman stopped, someone came over to ask me for help, an older woman who um, I said, well, I'm looking at um, la presse féminine. Um, you know, the, the, the feminine press is how you would, how you say it in, in French. It's a way of saying the women's press, right? And she stopped me to say, oh, no, no, this is in bibliothèque féministe. It's not a bibliothèque féminine, right? It's a feminist library, not a feminine or woman's library. And I was like, yes, exactly, right? <laughs> and it was just like such a funny moment. I was like, okay, but I promise you these magazines are here. And was, you know, um, so that like insistent, so she was from the other side, like, no, no, this is feminist. It's not just women. Um, and those things were totally entangled from the beginning. Okay, well, just to tangle things up a little bit more, I wanted to move us on to your um, to your most recent book, Before Trans, and um, how you came upon the sort of trans, pre-trans issue in France. Sure, so this is um, du Lafoy, Jane Dulafoy, um, who um, really kind of, for me, launched my whole, uh, you know, investigation here. And this is her um, in the pages of uh, Femina, I believe, alongside her husband, um, Marcel. And of course, I was immediately intrigued because as I've said, everyone else in these magazines was displayed as hyper-feminine. And Julafoy would always be um, in beautifully tailored men's suits alongside Marcel. And so I really wanted to understand what that was what was going on? Um, it, you know, what, just to, we had to, how did they see themselves within this context, right? So many questions. Um, following up, of course, from this magazine's book, I was eager to, I was so happy to have something to sort of keep, keep looking at, it kept me in the magazines for a little bit. Um, and what I discovered was that actually reading their work, and I, I should say as far as, um, so this is a book about trans identity in 19th century France, of course, before there was language in which to talk about it as such. Um, and the three writers that I ended up writing about it, and that's Du Lafoy in the middle, um, I write about them through feminine pronouns. There was kind of an issue for me as I came, as I was sort of deep in the writing, like how do I refer to these people who I really saw as early trans figures who were struggling with gender identity. Um, 
And so I do write about them in the feminine pronoun because I didn't want to kind of choose a pronoun for them. But more recently, I have started referring to them um, sometimes at, through they, them, which is a pronoun not that I think they would have chosen, but one that's used by American scholars to say, this person was exploring their gender identity. We don't know which pronoun they, they would have chosen. So we use they so that you remember they didn't really see themselves as women. Mm. And I think that's really the case for all three. Could you uh, just give us a sort of capsule because we're running a little yeah. short of time, a capsule view of each of these women and how they dealt with their gender identity. Absolutely. Um, so, um, so Judah Foy wears pants for the first time, and this was the tantalizing pants permit of your um, of your of the teaser, right? So you had to have a permit to wear pants legally in Paris if you were a woman um, in the 19th century. Judah Foy rises to battle with Marcel in the Franco-Prussian War and begins wearing pants then, and then later on they travel together to Persia, to what is now Iran, um, and excavate. Um, huge parts of the city of um, Susa that's buried. And you can visit those, what they, the, what they brought back um, in, in the Louvre, actually. Um, and so they, the two of them became celebrities, but more so Judafwa because they wrote their memoirs describing in the process um, their kind of taking on of a masculine identity and their deep identification with masculinity. So Judafwa um, writes uh, that the subject of this the title of this section is Masculinity for God and Country. They were kind of Joan of Arc figure and they saw themselves themselves as wearing pants because God, you know, a kind of hero for France. And that sort of authorized this masculine identity. But there was also kind of a lifelong exploration in their writing, their unpublished um, in their archives biographies of other people who crossed gender over time. Um, and you see this search um, for, um, for, for, for precedent for historical figures that they could identify with, that Jane could identify with. Marcel was elected to the Académie Française, to circle back to that, um, and the archives are, are located there, and they were this kind of amazing, um, idiosyncratic, fabulous power couple. And Julafois house is now, was, was donated to the, um, to the Red Cross, but a much of um, her living room is still intact there um, in the 16th century. Uh, but we can visit her living room. You can try. I mean, it's not a museum. It's the Red Cross um, headquarters, but there's a lovely man who works there who will happily show you. So Jane was accepted as a kind of iconoclast? Yes, because of Orientalism, right? Because of what they had accomplished in bringing back these treasures to the, to the Louvre. That was seen in the 19th century, like being an explorer, bringing this stuff back was seen as a heroic gesture that would um, you know, elevate French status in the world. And they were, they were both sort of un untouchable and they were this sort of an eccentric, very conservative in a very conservative milieu. She was also very Catholic um, and married, right? Uh, and so she all, have kids? No, um, no. And there's sort of interesting allusions to that. Um, she was very close with her, with family, um, and there are other accounts that she was very sad that she wasn't able to have children um, and identified to a certain extent as a kind of woman, but one that she then I, you know, defines as having really very little in common with um, the other women of her time. What's interesting from your book is that these three women, uh, people that you write about, uh, all lived in Paris around the same time, in the same time periods, but they didn't seek each other out. Right. They're in very different milieu. Um, you know, Judah Foy, I mean, I have this sort of alternate um, HBO version of it in my mind where they all meet in secret and all kinds of interesting conversations happen. Um, but um, but Judah Foy is in this very conservative milieu and um, the other two are not quite in the same kind of academic circles. Mm. They all had friends in common. Um, they were all aware of each other. And I think it was probably kind of too terrifying to acknowledge um, what that similarity might be. Um, Let's move on to Rashield. Can you tell us a little bit about Rashield? Yeah, so Rashield is the most, most well-known by current scholars. Um, it was extremely prolific and made their debut with the novel Monsieur Venus, which was this very gender-bendy 
Um, and that picture in the middle with the hat is sort of what Brescia looked like in the in the 1880s, although we don't have too many photographs of them. Um, but but uh, and they started wearing pants. They had a pants permit in the um, in the 1880s. Um, really, they is a is the is perhaps most apt as a pronoun for Rush Shield because they always talked about this kind of double identity. And even the name Rush Shield was one that they described as having come upon in a seance with a nobleman from the 17th century. Um, so, but it's a kind of gender neutral term, and they do describe sort of seeing themselves as as neutral, not wanting to say, take sides. Um, but um, but you but they're they're writing what what struck me in rereading Mr. Venus, which is this novel that you know lots of French grad students in America at least read to this day. Actually, not so much in France, um, because it's so gendery and people have sort of never known what to do with Rashield. Reading Rashield alongside Jules Lafoy made me realize that they were really working out a very similar set of questions, but in very different domains because Jules Lafoy is super conservative, writing about Joan of Arc. Whereas Rashield is writing as in decadence and there's lots of sex and all kinds of, you know, sort of more transgressive tropes, but at heart, they are using writing to try to make sense of themself, themselves. Mm -hmm. And that was, that's really what the book is about. And so. And this is your third subject. Yeah. And so Marc de Montifo was the, is the, the third one. Marc de Montifo was an art critic known by this name. Um, before people realized who they, they were and before they, this is, these photos are incredible sort of mark the um so to speak <laughs> no pun intended mark the uh, their their transition you can watch how they're sort of um documenting different kinds of sartorial right clothing options and they sort of settle into those last two um and there's a kind of freedom in their writing that that comes out of that um, but I am me, that last, just to wrap it up, like that je suis moi, I am me, that was sort of the, the motto for, for Marc de Montifo, which was just, please just let me be myself. Um, no one else should really have to concern themselves with it. And I really just traced through each one how they wrote their way through questions that hadn't been fully articulated in the 19th century. That's beautiful. Um, Simon wanted to ask an audience question, Simon. Simon, you're muted. You need to unmute yourself, please. Apologies. Question from Susan Bakewell. Uh, any cross currents with women artists of this period, uh, e.g. Berthe Morisseau or anyone else? Um, absolutely. And there's so much more to be explored there. Um, they were not friends with Berthe Morisseau. There's no, there, there, there's no actual relationships between the, as far as I know, through the actual artists. Um, but, um, but the thing about before trans is that people who know this period immediately start to make, uh, sort of have recognition of other figures that they might've heard of. And that's part of what I was doing is sort of reframing and saying, there's actually a lot of really complicated things going on with gender in the 19th century, especially in the late 19th century, long before we had sort of the terminology that we have today to think it through. Rachel, I just to, as a coda, I just wanted to bring us back to the 21st century because um, you, as we said at the beginning, you teach at Yeshiva University, which is a university, an excellent university for Orthodox Jewish men and women. There are separate campuses for men and women, and you teach the men. So, what's it like to teach uh, trans history to Orthodox Jewish men in the Bronx? <laughs> um. Yeah, life is interesting that way, right? You end up in these positions, you didn't realize you're getting your PhD from that. I do come from a kind of line of rabbis, so there are easier ways to get into a Jewish institution than a PhD in French. Um, but um, what's interesting, you know, it's, it, I'm, I'm coming to people who have very little contact with, it's not the jaded American college student that you might find in other institutions, right? So I have people who are really, open, um, the ones who are in my classes, to thinking about these things and haven't really had um, a framework for thinking about it before. Um, so most of all, it's that. It's really kind of coming to it without, without a lot of background and a really earnest effort to think it through that is also challenging as I'm always the only woman in the room and there are, it's not a place that one could be trans and out, you know, there are queer students, 
Um, but it's still a place that that's a very challenging identity. I'm always speaking anytime I speak in any student context or any context with the knowledge that there could be people who are trans and working or you know dealing with these issues, struggling with these issues. And, um, and, and most of all, I wanna be sensitive to them and reach them because I know from studying these figures how important it was to them to see versions of themselves, to recognize themselves. And so, you know, I hope that my work offers that. Well, Rachel, thank you so much for being